Amen. Welcome to week 20. Uh, what about uh, the supposed evolution uh, from monkey to man? Because I won't have time to say it later, I'm going to say it now. If what, the things I say remotely interest you tonight, this is by far the best book I've ever seen on this subject. The name is Bones of Contention. It's Marvin Lubinow. I'll pass it around in case you want to write down the name. Um, but it is by far, if, or I'll just throw it on the floor, but it is by far the best um, material I've ever seen on this particular subject that we'll talk about tonight. So again, we will be moving quick tonight, so I'll be talking fast, so please listen fast, but let's get going. Okay, so we're at week 20, lesson 20, what about the supposed evolution of men? We end next week on the magnificence, the beauty of the creation. I would encourage you, if you missed the first 20, make 21. It is the pentacle, in my opinion, of everything that I'm going to say. Okay, a few words tonight, we're just going to run through them. <laughs> Working definitions, we'll run through them real quick. The first one is genus. So when we talk about genus, that's a biological term. We're talking about a family of organisms, a subdivision that is very large. Like Homo sapiens are in the genus Homo, and we'll talk about that in a second. The next word is taxonomy. Now taxonomy is a scientific word that defines biological organisms. So we set up a taxon, we say that they're biologically similar, and we put them in the same taxon, the same taxonomy. That's another word you'll see tonight. Phylogenetic, that's pretty interesting. That is again a biological word. It's the study of evolutionary history, in particular looking at relationships that link animals together. So we would look at them phylogenically to see the relationships. And then finally, homo, not finally, we have Australopithecine as well. Homo, Latin for being human, that's a genus. So homo sapiens fall under the genus homo, and we'll talk more about that. And then finally, Australopithecine or Australopithecus, that means southern ape. So typically when you're seeing something that's being presented as an Australopithecus or Australopithecine, regardless of what the next Latin phrase is, you're dealing with something that is probably a monkey or an ape. So those are our words. They'll come up tonight. So this is Natural Geographic, the first pioneer. You can tell, sort of human-like, but not really, right? So my question, is this guy really in our family tree? Does this monkey-looking, sort of human guy really in our family tree? That's what's being taught. But the Bible's crystal clear. Genesis is crystal clear. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. I mean, it's crystal clear. It's so obvious we could end right now and say Genesis is clear. The Lord Jesus, when he said in the beginning he made the male and female, that's clear. We can put this to rest. We can wrap it up and sing for the rest of the evening. This is a settled deal. There's no evolution of men. But that wouldn't be fair because you're going to run into folks who believe there is, and you need to be able to give a response. So let's get going. Two things you need to know about the supposed evolution of men. You probably know these. There are some in the field that have an agenda. You'll see that tonight. Why they have an agenda, I don't need to speculate, but they're working to prove that monkey-to-man evolution is true, and oftentimes they're willing to bend or even misrepresent or out-and-out out create fraud to prove the point. But let's be honest, there are awards and rewards for any who can bring forth evidence of monkey-to-man evolution that will hold up. Whether that reward is in the form of book uh, contracts, whether it's speaking engagements, or whether it's a lucrative assignment to a prestigious university. There is a lot at stake for anyone who can prove monkey-to-man evolution. This is taken from a biology textbook. Um, there's hundreds of different ones on the internet. There is no accepted phylogenetic chart or graph of the evolution of man. You kind of just have to pick one, and so I picked a very common one. You can find some that'll have 100, 100 little different creatures on here, but we'll pick the common ones, the most widely accepted ones, and find that they're not very widely accepted as it turns out. So this is what we'll be working from tonight, this phylogenetic trace, and in particular, we're interested in this arrow that leads to man. We're not worried about this one that leads to other apes. We don't care about that. We're about this one that leads to modern man. That's what we'll be tracing through tonight. Um, so before we follow the supposed evolutionary progression of monkey to man, I want to be clear on one point, and I want to show you something. 
You only find this perfect phylogenetic chart in two places. You know the places. The internet and, unfortunately, textbooks. Once you leave the internet and textbooks, you will not find this anywhere. You definitely will not find it in the fossil record. So let's get going. Before we look at that diagram, I need to show you evolution's hall of shame. The first member of the evolutionary hall of shame is a guy who goes by the name of Piltdown Man. Piltdown Man was discovered in 1912, essentially, in Piltdown, England. What was discovered was a very old-looking skull cap and a very old-looking, although monkey-like, jawbone. They were found in the same region there in Piltdown, and the claim was made that this was a 500,000-year-old intermediate between monkey and man. This is the New York Times. They ran the article. Darwin theory is proved true. English scientists say the skull found in Sussex establishes human descent from apes. This same evidence was used in the Scopes trial. This guy remained in history books. This guy remained in textbooks for 40 years. That wasn't until further research was done. And what was uncovered is that Charles Dawson has executed, had executed a fraud. He had taken a skull cap and stained it to give it age. He had taken a orangutan jaw and stained it to give it age. He had filed the teeth to make them look more human-like. He had buried it in the dirt, and then he had went out and found it and heralded a 500,000-year-old man that for 40 years held up, even as evidence at the Scopes trial. The truth, the skull cap was 600 years old. The orangutan jaw was modern. A complete fraud that he stained and filed and buried in the dirt. Thus, Piltdown Man enters evolution's hall of shame. Next is Nebraska Man, the next entrance into the hall of shame. Found in 1922 was a tooth in Nebraska. This tooth was presented to paleontologist Henry Field Osborne, who happens to be an ardent evolutionist, by the geologist Harold Cook. As he looked at this tooth, he said, Aha! This is clearly a tooth from a monkey man, from the evolution of man. This is clearly a descendant or, or an ancestor of man that's a million years old. All this was based on a single tooth. In England, they ran with this, and Grafton Smith convinced the London News to run a two-page article and to print this picture of Nebraska man proving monkey to man evolution. This million year old man, look at Nebraska man. He's got a club, very monkey looking. There's his wife, very monkey looking, digging in the dirt. Nebraska man's going out to club somebody. By the way, built on one tooth, and he was used in the 1925 Scopes trial. That was until further research was done on that particular point where the tooth was found. And they uncovered other bones and other teeth. And guess what it turned out to be? Not a million-year-old man. It turned out to be an extinct American pig. The entire thing fabricated from one tooth and ran with by the media. There's the real Nebraska man. <laughs> Last and next on evolution's hall of shame is Rampithecus. Rampithecus was actually found in 1932 in Nepal on the Tanao River. They found um, the jawbone, they found a few teeth and some bones. There's what they drew, and here's what they speculated. This is a 14 million year old ape-like ancestor to modern humans, and they ran with it. Now, it was found in 1932. It went up, it went down. In the 1960s, it regained popularity. So much so that in 1977, Time Magazine ran this article. Rampithecus is ideally structured to be an ancestor of hominids. If he isn't, we don't have anything else that is. Let that ring in your mind. If he isn't, we don't have anything else that is. Guess what? The claim went for a few years to the tune of 40 until in 1970, a baboon living in Ethiopia was discovered with the exact same dental structure as Rampithecus. The bones they had found, similar morphological features, and Rampithecus was quietly taken off all of those beautiful charts about monkey-to-man evolution. Thus, he enters forever 
the hall of shame. Now, as you look at these, Piltdown Man was a hoax, Nebraska Man was a pig, and Rampithecus was an ape. But where did the dates come from? 500,000 years, a million years, 14 million years. Let me help you where they came from. They were fabricated. They were made up to prove their religion. And they broke down under scrutiny or additional information. Because we already know God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now we can talk about what it means to be created in the image of God. That's a great topic, but clearly there's no evolution here. But let's get back to the diagram. Let's start out with the first on this textbook's uh, list, and that's Cro-Magnon Man. Now, Cro-Magnon Man dates somewhere. Makes, let me make sure I have my dates right so I don't throw you off. It's a 30 to 40,000 years. Is that what I have on your sheets? Because I've got my sheets out of order here. 30 to 40,000? Oh, 10 to 40. Okay, I'm sorry. 10 to 40,000. What's funny is we now have him running right alongside modern Homo sapiens, which go all the way back to 200,000. Many now believe the taxon of Cro-Magnon man should be sunk into Homo sapiens. A Cro-Magnon man could walk up to you today, he's morpholo morphologically just like you and I. He should be sunk into modern Homo sapiens. And again, most believe that now. Next is Neanderthals. Neanderthals were first discovered in 1856 in Dusseldorf, Germany. This is the original drawing that uh, accompanied the find. Now, if you look at this guy, a couple things leap out to me. He's clearly man-like in that he's standing. He's very muscular. He looks very mean. I would not want to get hit by that club. He's, I would not be the one to be the homo sapien that's walking around that wall. Um, but here Neanderthal is, dated between 250 and 400,000 years ago. Clearly, if we're to believe the drawing, he is an ape man. The problem is, if you look at the Neanderthal skull, it looks strikingly similar to a modern Homo sapien skull. The only slight variation is the heavier brow ridge, but many modern humans have a heavier brow ridge. That's not outside our morphological characteristics. If he walked up to you, he would look not look like that, I can assure you. But it gets worse. This next video clip is taken from Evolution's Achilles Heels and discusses Neanderthals. I don't know any paleontologist but I don't today know any that be able to draw that today that be able to draw that series we saw in previous decades. decades. We saw in previous decades. There are so many there supposed are so species many of evolutionary species tree of human evolutionary history today. Tree of human it's hard, even to, it's hard even to list them all. But let's just pick the most popular one. Let's just pick the most popular one. Neanderthal It was originally man. depicted it was as originally a half depicted monkey, a distant as a relative, monkey, a real caveman. relative, a real caveman. Today, everything has changed. Everything different has changed. Paleontologists are different trying paleontologists are trying to make the case Neanderthal painting. Caves, Neanderthal painting ceremonially caves, buried their dead ceremonially with their heads buried pointing towards the sunrise, their heads made pointing musical towards the sunrise, had the controlled use of fire, fire, had the controlled use of fire, search the landscape for rare minerals in order to make cosmetics. In order to make cosmetics. That is not the Neanderthal man I grew up with. That is not the Neanderthal man I grew up with. And now that the genetics revolution is upon us, we've been able to construct five or six different Neanderthal genomes. We've been able to construct five or six different Neanderthal genomes. strong evidence that strong modern man and the Neanderthals interbred, and Neanderthals meaning interbred we are the same species, species by, the same by species. definition. By definition. Thing like we've been told. In the initial construction, say that again? I did. <laughs> initial construction, constructed to look very ape like. In all honesty, the brain capacity on average is. 100 to 200 cc's larger than the average human brain capacity, but keep in mind it's well within the range of human brain capacity. You'll look at that in a moment. Jewels jewelry, musical instruments, cave paintings, capable of speech, buried their dead. That was the original drawing. Here's a more modern drawing. But if we leave the drawings alone and go to the computer reconstruction, to go to Derek's point, I think I knew a girl like that. Um, this is from Renard, Marvin Lubinow. Most anthropologists recognize burial as a very human and a very religious act, but the strongest evidence that Neanderthals were fully human and of our species is that at four sites, Neanderthals and modern humans are buried together. This is, and I'll, I'll mess up his name, um, analysis of Neanderthal DNA failed to demonstrate any significance from DNA of modern humans. This is Dave Phillips. Neanderthals were humans. They buried their dead, used tools, had a complex social structure, uh, employed language, and played musical instruments. 
Neanderthal anatomical differences are extremely minor and can be, for the most part, explained as a result of a genetically isolated people that lived a rigorous life in a harsh, cold climate, I would add, following the flood. This is Minton, David Minton. You'll see him in a little bit. Despite the overwhelming evidence that Neanderthals were simply a race of stocky humans, imaginative artists with the encouragement of some evolutionists have consistently rendered them as stooped ape men. The Neanderthal was indeed a homo sapien. Everything about him was human. As we go back to our list, these first two are clearly human. Let's go now look at Homo sapiens ancient or Homo sapiens archaic. Unofficial and debated taxon, sloping skull with a brain capacity right along with modern man, heavy ridge over the eye similar to Neanderthals, rear of the skull slightly more rounded than Neanderthals, but here's the difference. Once you leave the minor differences of the cranium, you can't tell the bone difference from a modern human being, a modern Homo sapien. And these guys supposedly lived years ago, 300,000 years ago, all the way to 30,000 years ago. You have them living contemporarily alongside modern Homo sapiens. It just falls apart. It's an unofficial debated taxon. When you look at the skulls, what you're looking at is a Homo sapien. They're simply humans, and only, as I said, the most argumentative evolutionists would not agree the archaic Homo sapiens should be sunk into Homo sapiens. Next on the hit list, we have this guy called Homo erectus. Uh, let me get, make sure I get my right here. Found in, or excuse me, in 1891, supposedly the evolutionary link between humans and apes. Um, you can see the date range that they've given this guy, 2 million to 140,000 years ago. Here's the problem with this. We've already found over 78 individual fossils that are dating less than 30,000 years ago. This guy's running right alongside their dates with Neanderthal, right alongside their dates with ancient Homo sapiens, right alongside their dates with modern Homo sapiens. You've got all of these things together burying their, each other and the DNA coming into alignment. It's just a slightly smaller version of a Neanderthal. It's just an isolated group. So the skull size of Homo, Homo erectus ranged between 780 and 1225 cc's for the ones we found. Neanderthals, 1200 to 1650. Homo sapiens archaic, 1100 to 1300. Modern humans average 1,400, but here's the real rub. The range for our skull cap size is 700 to 2,000 cc's. If you will notice, all of those guys are right in the middle of what is a normal range for a modern Homo sapien. What we're dealing with are humans that are being paraded and painted to look ape-like. They're nothing but humans. And so many scholars now believe that even Homo erectus should be sunk into Neanderthals, which should be sunk into Homo sapiens. We found them using tools. We found them building shelters. In one case, we found them where they created a necklace, a quartzite rock that was carved into a human figurine. They're humans made in the image of God. So that's Homo erectus. Next, you have this guy here, Homo habilis. Let me get my dates right. The date for Homo habilis Discovered in 1959, 2.5 2 million years to 1.4 million years old. Again, you have him living along with Homo erectus, which we've already sunk into modern humans. And for years, there was conflicting information in the taxon. It looked like we had things mixed up, but we could never find one intact to prove it until 1986 when for the first time a Homo habilis skull was found in a pit with postcranial material. So we weren't putting pieces together from different digs. The pieces were all there. He was this tall. He was a monkey. He had a chimpanzee skull cap. You want to see his head? There's what a buildup of his head looks like. Homo habilis is not in the human lineage. Homo habilis is in the chimpanzee lineage, maybe, Homo habilis is a monkey. He's alongside with Australopithecus amphorensis, which we'll talk about in a minute. But that's Homo habilis. So Homo, absolutely not. Australopithecine, absolutely. Next on the list is this guy called Australopithecus afarensis. Now that's not Lucy. That's a typo on my part. Australopithecus afarensis is Lucy. But Australopithecus africanus is a guy who 
many scholars now believe is the same species as Australopithecus afarensis, which is Lucy, and that he should be sunk into her taxon. So, now of all these, the most famous by far is Lucy. We've all heard of Australopithecus africanus. And so let's talk about her for just a moment. This is the bones of the original Australopithecus afarensis that were found in 1974 by Richard Leakey. That's not the real bones, that's a redo of them. They say it's 40% of the original skeleton. You've got to be kidding me. I would say about 20%. There's no hands, no feet, and only one piece of a leg. There's the whole skull, maybe a half of the pelvis, 20% maybe, definitely not 40%. Here comes the problem. Along the same area, they found the Latoli Trail. Here's a picture of the Latoli Trail. It's considered the oldest footprints of a modern-looking human foot that's been dated, radiometric dated, to 3.75, 3.5 to 3.75 million years old. This blows evolution out of the water because Homo sapiens can't be walking around three and a half million years ago. The find of Lucy was the save. They said, aha, it was Lucy, this little three-foot chimpanzee that made these prints. Now keep in mind, the original find had no feet. They didn't know what her feet looked like. But she was the savior for this whole problem of these human footprints Two adults and a child walking through this ash dated at three and a half million years ago. So Lucy took on a date around, I think in yours I say 2.9 to like 3.8. And so here now she becomes the, the gold standard of monkey to man human evolution. And off we go. Um, this is Mary Leakey as she's talking about these footprints. She's the evolutionist. The footprints are described as remarkably similar to those of modern man. The form of his foot was exactly the same as ours. This is a three-foot-tall Australopithecus afarensis that she hadn't seen the feet of yet. Weight-bearing pressure patterns in the prints resemble human ones, footprints so very much like our own. This is Russell Tootle, who's done the most research on these footprints. Here's what he says. The Latoli prints are indistinguishable from those of habitually barefoot Homo sapiens. You know why they're indistinguishable? Okay. He further states the real problem, the only problem, is that to ascribe those fossil footprints to Homo does not fit the evolutionary time scale. Did you hear what he said? He said the real problem here is we've dated them at three and a half million years old, and we know that's not true. So we know somebody else did them. Lubinow concludes with this, there's no evidence that any other creature, past or present, had a foot exactly like the human foot. He goes on to say, if the Latoli footprints were not known to be so old, we would readily conclude they were made by a member of our own genus, Homo, who went habitually barefoot. There's what was found. There's what the St. Louis Zoo mocked up. This is the most famous mock-up of Lucy. Some things should jump out at you. The posture just like ours. The hands, she has all five fingers, just like ours. The foot that made the Latoli Trail, by the way, we need that foot, looks just like ours. This is from Lucy, She's No Lady. This is Dr. David Minton talking about these finds. What are uh, the what obvious, obvious uh, misrepresentations the obvious here? Misrepresentations well, first here. of all, the hands well, first of all, and the, the feet. Hands uh, let's and the just feet. take a look. Uh, let's just take at, a, a little more detail here. At, There's a the more hand. Detail here. There's the you hand. You can play piano. You can with play a hand piano like this with a hand like or this. Or violin. Or Notice violin. that the finger bones Notice are that the straight. Notice the finger bones are straight. Uh, the whole hand has uh, a, a whole very hand human has like a very human like quality. Curved have fingers. Curved the finger fingers. bones, the phalanges, the bones, instead of being phalanges, relatively straight, being have, relatively a straight have a curvature to them. And so they have a kind of a and so they have a kind of a neat uh, looking uh, hand that's quite uh, looking hand. Very, it's quite distinct, uh, well suited for a well being suspensory adapted, adapted, adapted or hanging from a limb. Uh, uh, but not great for uh, playing not piano great or pipe for organ. Piano or pipe organ. Uh, Lucy here, the way she's uh, shown, would be very good at the ladder. Not very good at hanging from limbs. Not very good at hanging from limbs. 
Well, we know this isn't well, the case we know because even the before case the exhibit was made, made in the St. Louis Zoo, Stern and Sussman had published, and paper, Sussman had published in the American paper, Journal of Physical Anthropology, a rather sizable one at that. And uh, in this paper, and, they looked uh, in at, this many paper, they looked the at many of the Hadar australopithecines, that, that is of the type that, that Lucy represents. And they compared the curvature, compared the curvature of, her finger of, bones. of her finger bones. Remember, Lucy Remember, herself Lucy didn't herself have finger didn't bones. Have but there have been other specimens of Australopithecus afarensis that, that do. do. And so these bones, so have, these been bones have been compared. And you see them, you after, see them the AL after the AL3 figure, figure, figure here. And the data points, and the are, data here. points are here. And they're being compared they're to being human, compared, which, is here, which is here, and other and living other apes. Living apes. And what we and see what is, we as see you look at each, each of the at different, each finger, different bones finger bones for living apes versus human versus Lucy, is that with an is exceptional, with an exceptional data, point data point here and there, which may be a fragmentary fossil, fossil uh, the, cluster uh, the cluster is actually is towards actually the most towards the curved, curved of the ape of phalanges. The ape phalanges. So we could say so that we could Lucy, say had, that Lucy highly had highly curved fingers or phalanges, phalanges by, ape by ape standards. The typical, the typical suspensory adapted adapt type, type of hand. And this is not this the is hand not the shown, hand shown on, on the creature that we have in the St. Louis Zoo. Now let's take, now a, look let's at take a look at the feet. Well, first we'll, well, say, first uh, we'll say what Stern and Sussman concluded, concluded about, about the hand, then we'll look at the feet. Then we'll look at the feet. Uh, their conclusion uh, their was, uh, was that a summary of the morphological and functional affinities of the Hadar hand leads inexorably leads to, an to an image of a image suspensory of a adapted, adapted hand, hand that is hanging from a limb of a tree, surprisingly similar to the hands found in the small end of the pygmy chimp range. So it would be so completely, it would be completely inappropriate, inappropriate for anyone to paint or make, paint a, model or make a model of Lucy of showing Lucy anything showing other than, than, highly other curved, than highly curved uh, fingers. Uh, fingers. Another recent, Another observation, recent observation, that observation that was published, uh, uh, published uh, is that, uh, is that uh, these particular australopithecines, which include afarensis, have been found, have been found to have, found to have uh, locking, uh, wrist, locking bones. wrist bones. And this is found, and in, this knuckle is found in knuckle walkers. So that if you really so wanted, you to, really show wanted to show properly Lucy in the zoo, properly in the zoo, uh, it would be a good uh, idea a to get her down idea on her knuckles, to get her as, down her knuckles as any proper ape would be. Uh, doing a bit of knuckle walking. Uh, doing a bit of knuckle walking. But that wouldn't get the impression across. Certainly our zoo in St. Louis wants to get across, and I doubt many will go for it. And I doubt many will go for it. Let's look at that foot. Let's look at that foot. Have you ever seen a foot like that before? a foot like that Sure you have. Kick off a shoe. Take a look. Kick off a shoe. Take a look. Your foot is probably not quite. That is hairy, probably not quite but this that is hairy, a distinctly human this is foot. A there is no human foot. animal. There is no earth animal that has a foot on earth remotely foot like the human foot. Like the human foot. So this, uh, so this. Uh, uh, maybe another misrepresentation. Uh, maybe another and once misrepresentation. Again, and once again, uh, Stern and Sussman uh, Stern looked and at the Sussman toe bone, looked the at the toe bone, the toe, of the toe, and looked at their curvature, and looked at their curvature, and the curvature again the is, curvature at the high again end is at the high end of the apes. Of are the, the apes. apes. Here are the and, apes. Uh, you're getting more curved and, uh, as you go to the right. Curved as you go to the right. Here is the Hadar australopithecine, the Lucy-like creature, the Lucy-like creature. I'm going to keep going, but here's the point. In the initial find, there were no hands and feet. We've since found hands and feet of the Australopithecus afarensis. They are at the extreme curved end of chimpanzees and monkeys. Not only did she not have a human hand or a human foot, she had a highly monkey-like hand and foot. We found them now. Equally, we now know she was a knuckle walker. He is exactly right. She didn't walk upright. But it's even worse than that, so I'll let him pick it up again. The big problem, however, the are the hips. The big problem, hips. however, are the hips. Uh, as you know, all ladies are concerned uh, you know, about that, so I would think Lucy and is too. And let's look at these hip bones. And let's look at these hip bones. Uh, the really three bones uh, that fit really together, three to, form bones that fit together to form the whole uh, pelvis. I brought along the right uh, I brought along piece, the the right piece of the human pelvis here. It fits right down here. It uh, fits right down and here. And they're made of three different bones. And they're made the of three different part, bones. The iliac part, the pubic part, which is right pubic in front here. Part, which is right and right here is the ischium. These are the ischial tuberosities. And you are all sitting on your ischial tuberosities right now. That's what's supporting the weight That's what's supporting through the gluteus maximus. Through the gluteus maximus. Now. There's, now, a distinct hip there's a distinct for apes hip for and apes. And as far as, I know, no as far as I know, 
no you can't overlap. confuse an APIP you with a You can't confuse hip. an APIP with a human What's hip. the big difference? What's the big well, difference? Well, let me uh, bring up a drawing well, let me, uh, that'll help bring up a drawing this. that'll help to illustrate this. If you look at the top, that's a if you chimp. look at the top, that's a chimp. And at the bottom, that would be human. And at the bottom, that would be Notice human. Notice the iliac blades. Notice the of iliac the human blades of the human go front to back like this. Go it front to back like this. It almost looks like a steering yoke on an airplane. When you get together, right? When you get them both together, right? As you look at it, isn't that sort of like? As you look at it, isn't that sort of like a steering yoke? Airplane, see the handle here and the handle here, upside down. Whereas the ape, the iliac blades flare out Whereas the ape, the iliac blades flare out laterally. Whereas the ape, the iliac blades flare out laterally. So if I put this in place, if I put this in place, it would be here. The human, this blade would be and here. The ape it would be out here. And the ape it would be and out the picture, here. This the picture. This versus this. Now why is that this important? This this. Now you why need is to that have important? it this way if you're going to you walk. You need to have it this way if you're going to walk. Humans walk. Why is that so? As humans walk. Why is that so? <laughs> My students tell me <laughs> that I was tell one time or another able to use one time or another able to use almost every item of clothing. Illustrate things. Handkerchiefs can make muscles. Handkerchiefs can make and muscles. If we have a muscle that attaches, we have to, a muscle the that attaches to the iliac blade medius. here called the gluteus medius. And that muscle comes down. And that muscle comes down from here to here. From here to here. Right across there. And right attaches across to this bump. And attaches to this on the bump. Femur. On the femur. Now that, that's important because now that, that's important when we because lift our left when leg. When we lift our left leg. Think of an articulated dowel. Think of an articulated If you dowel lift the leg, what's going to happen? If you lift the if leg, what's going to happen? If these the are hip, articulated joints at the hip. This hip's going to fall, isn't it? This hip's going to fall, isn't it? Lift the left leg. The lift left, the left hip leg. Will fall. The left. If hip I lift will fall. the right leg, if the right I lift the right leg, the right what keeps this from fall. happening? What keeps this from happening? When I lift the left leg, when I lift the, the left that leg, goes between the muscle here and here, goes between tightens here up and here, and it tightens up, happening. and it keeps that from happening. It's attached here. It's attached here. So if you don't have this orientation, so if you don't have this orientation of the iliac blade, you cannot keep your posture as you walk. Keep your posture as you even. Uh, once, again, even, uh, once again, you have to throw the weight back and forth. Once again, you have to throw the weight back to overcome this. Now, on overcome apes, this. the blade now is apes, like this. The blade is like this. I've exaggerated a bit. I've exaggerated a bit. The same muscle gluteus medius the same comes over the back side. Now, notice that. It's notice going that. down the back. And it's going down the back. And have a center of gravity in front of have their knees. Have a center of gravity in front of their knees. They want to fall over forward anyway. And so the same muscle. And so the same muscle keeps them from falling for their forward. So you can look at the pelvis. So you can look at the pelvis. Whether you're looking at an ape whether pelvis, you're looking at an ape pelvis, that anything at all like we do, anything at all or a like human pelvis. The big or question human is, the big what question kind of pelvis does what Lucy kind of have? Pelvis does Lucy have? Well, Stern and Sussman said. Well, Stern and Sussman the fact said that the anterior portion the of the iliac blade faces laterally in humans. Laterally in humans. Uh, he's talking at. Uh, he's talking this at. This is facing. This is facing out here. Lateral out here, rather than over. Over. Uh, but uh, not in chimps is not obvious. In chimps is obvious. The marked resemblance, the mark of, Lucy resemblance the of Lucy to the chimpanzee is, is equally obvious. So you get the picture. So you get the picture. The creatures like Lucy. The creatures like Lucy have the ape have orientation, the ape of, the orientation of the iliac blades. Now what blades. are the evolutionists? Now what are the evolutionists going to do about that? You're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. Nova, have you heard Nova? Nova? They there was a PBS Nova PBS series, Nova in, which series Dr. in which Dr. Owen Lovejoy, a very Owen Lovejoy, famous, famous paleoanthropologist, was involved. And he's looking at Lucy's he's looking skeleton at Lucy's here, skeleton and he's lamenting, here, and he's the lamenting the fact that the hips are, all, the hips wrong. are all wrong. They're supposed to They're be human-like human hips, so you can hips, walk so the way the Lapoli footprints, footprints showed, she, showed walked. she walked. But they don't but look they don't like look human hips. Like they look like hips. They look like hips. What to do about this? Watch it. Get a big kick out of this. The ape that stood up that stood up was a revolutionary, was a revolutionary idea. idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's Love expertise, Love expertise, expertise again because the evidence because wasn't, the evidence quite, adding wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, the, knee looked but human, the, shape, of her hip but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, Superficially her, hip her hip resembled a chimpanzee, resembled a chimpanzee which meant that Lucy which meant couldn't that Lucy possibly, couldn't have, walked possibly like have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed Love something, Joy noticed odd something odd about the way the bones, the way the bones fossilized. Fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we pelvis. had, Together this part of the pelvis has this pressed so hard and so completely into this one and so completely that it caused it to be broken that it caused into it a series of individual into pieces, a series which of were then fused together, pieces, which were then fused together. So you see, they were uh, so you broken, see they and were they uh, don't broken fit together and properly. Uh, fit together properly. They did uh, speculate uh, in the program, uh, as, to exactly in the program who as to who was responsible for breaking the hip. 
Well, and, for breaking uh, the perhaps hip. Scientific evidence and, uh, suggests perhaps scientific evidence suggests on it. perhaps a deer Here stepped on Here you can see it. a deer foot stepping uh, on the bone. Isn't that a bummer? Uh, let's uh, see where it goes from here. Uh, let's uh, see where it goes from here. Uh, this has caused the two bones, uh, in fact, this has fit together so the two well bones, in fact, so that well. they're in an anatomically so well. impossible position. <laughs> the perfect fit the perfect was an illusion was that, an made, illusion Lucy's that made Lucy's hip bones seem to flare, out, seem to like flare out like a chimps. But all was not lost. But all was not lost. <laughs> this is a power <laughs> saw, This is a friend. power saw, friends. <laughs> You may want to put your goggles, you on. Put your goggles on. Lovejoy decided Lovejoy he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. natural shape. He didn't want to tamper, he didn't with, the want to tamper with the so original, he made a copy so he made a plaster. copy in plaster. Notice he's removing Notice whole, he's parts, removing whole parts, parts, not just He cut the damaged he pieces out and put them back together, back together the way they were the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job. It was a tricky job. After taking the king out of the pelvis, it all perfectly. fit together like perfectly. a three-dimensional like jigsaw, three jigsaw puzzle. Look how perfect. Puzzle. Look how perfect. You can read a newspaper, can read a newspaper As a result, the, the, angle, result, of the, hip the angle of the hip like a chimps, but a lot like ours. <laughs> but a lot like ours. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is what we call <laughs> science. You can yeah, teach no, this, this is what in we public call science. Schools, you can teach you this in a public school, but you can't criticize it because if you do, uh, that, would be religious. Because if you do uh, that would be religious. Okay, so um, again, we'll kind of quickly go through here so I can wrap it up. This is uh, Richmond and Strait. Regardless of the status of Lucy's knee joint, new evidence has come forth that Lucy has the morphology of a knuckle walker. This is Stockstad. I walked over to the cabinet, pulled out Lucy, and Shazam. She had the morphology that was classic for knuckle walkers. This is Oxnard. The Australopithecines known over the last several decades are now irrevocably removed from a place in the evolution of hemobipedalism. And so we'll just, lots more, but here's the deal. Her hands and her feet, her brain is nothing in line with the human brain. She is a chimpanzee-like creature that went extinct. And by the way, her hands and her feet match exactly what we find in modern chimpanzees. The problem is the Latoli foot trail, but here's what I can tell you the answer. Lucy is not the hominid that <laughs> made that foot trail in Latoli. Conclusions, a knuckle walker, and she didn't make the trail. We'll skip this video and I'm gonna close with two points. The cave in Spain turns out that it made everything plain. In 1992, in a cave in Spain, Juan Luis, uh, I guess that's Arsuaga, and colleagues found an undisturbed burial pit where 33 individuals had been buried, all dating to approximately 400,000 years ago in evolutionary time. Derek, you're with me. The cranial characteristics in this one find of these 33 individuals showed seven similarities with Homo erectus, seven similarities with Homo sapiens, and 10 similarities with Neanderthals, all buried together. The extreme variation within the people group who use this cave to bury their dead erases all these distinctions. I would say this, the cave in Spain, turns out it makes everything plain. Here's what's happened. The human species, Homo sapiens, Archaic, Homo erectus, and Neanderthals have been downplayed and made to look more ape-like than they really are. They're really Homo sapiens. Meanwhile, the primate species, Homo habilis, Australopithecus africanus, Australopithecus afarensis, have been upplayed to look more human. They are, in fact, small, chimpanzee-like, knuckle-walking monkeys. Careful study proves that point. Thank you.